Good afternoon and welcome to Bite-Sized Corrosion. It's so fantastic that you've been able to join us. And as I look at the attendees today, it's so wonderful to see a mix of firm favorites, old friends, and some new faces as well. So thank you so much for taking time out to join us for lunch today. We're really excited to kick off our three-part dive, as it were, into pipeline and power line interactions. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Vanessa Seeley Fisher, and we are so privileged to be able to use this platform to share some bite-sized nuggets about corrosion. Today, we will be centering our discussion on the AC corrosion of pipelines. Let's welcome our guest for today, and I'm absolutely thrilled that Craig Buerta of Reignite has been willing to subject himself to another conversation with us. I'm sure many of you will remember Craig. Craig is a renowned metallurgical engineer. He runs Reignite, which is a corrosion, cathodic protection, and AC mitigation consultancy. And if you think he's familiar, that is indeed because he is. Craig joined us almost a year ago when we had an excellent discussion relating to AC mitigation. Now, if you missed it or you can't remember, I encourage you to watch it on YouTube or on our Teachable platform. So welcome back, Craig. It's so wonderful to have you with us again. That's great, Vanessa. Time's gone by so quickly and many more projects and a whole lot more questions, many unanswered still. So hopefully today we'll get even more questions and we continue the discussion. Indeed. Thank you. Craig, to kick off our discussion today, the majority of pipeline engineers are familiar with the concept of AC mitigation for a new pipeline. And just as an aside, we'll be chatting more about these ESCOM guidelines that, that do guide us in this in two weeks' time. So make sure you don't miss that discussion. But what I'd like us to focus on today is the scenario where the pipeline operator of an existing pipeline discovers levels of AC on his pipe, which he thinks may be a cause for concern. First off, as a pipeline operator, what should I be looking for as a, quote, scary level of AC on my pipe? And what's the risk anyway? That's a very good point. What I'm going to do now is I'll, I'll put up a slide and uh, we're probably going to jump back and forth over a handful of slides. And just the reason for putting these slides up, and uh, I'd need to give NACE or now ANPP uh, credit for some of the information that's shown. So. Please don't think that it's all mine or original work, but it's in the public domain um, through training courses, or if you do some research, you'll find that information as well. So I just want to start off with this particular slide, and it just quotes some current density values that are commonly referred to. Now, if you happen to attend the NACE interference or AMPP interference course, they will address these values at some point in them. Yeah, it does come across in some of the other courses as well, and it's also stated in the SP0169 standard. There are different tables, and I don't think we want to get into too much detail, but when are we going to pay attention to the likelihood of AC corrosion? I think that's really the context mm. of this slide. So we've got some values up there that the German research suggests anything below 20 amps per square meter, and we're talking AC current density. And they say that there's no corrosion under those conditions. And some folk are arguing now that corrosion is sustainable if, if certain pH values or iron concentrations are present. Then it becomes unpredictable in the range from 30 amps per square meter up to 100 amps. And then above 100 amps per square meter, you have significant likelihood of, of AC corrosion. So to answer your question, Vanessa, if you've got the monitoring tools in place, because I think that is maybe the question before this, is a pipeline owner um, can see these numbers on a screen and say, well, I don't even know how to measure AC current density. I think the important thing is you need to have the tools or the monitoring facilities in place uh, to monitor those values. Right, that takes us down a road we're not going to explore too much today, but the concept that in the design of cathodic protection systems now, we need to be looking at allowing the setup to have the necessary, as you say, the necessary tools so that we can measure these values as and when we are concerned. Yes, and, I, and as, as you say, I think Daniel is your next scheduled speaker. And um, I think that will be looking at the safety aspect. So I think there are two distinct issues. One is looking at the corrosion aspect, which we're just going to touch on today. 
Um, those are the values that we looked at now, and I'm very certain that Daniel will deal with the safety aspects and shock related issues in great detail. Right. Um, Craig, we've heard of a couple of examples mm. of AC corrosion on, on pipelines overseas. Have there been any pipelines in South Africa where we know that the corrosion was AC related? Yeah, so obviously I have to be careful with what we share. Certainly. Some of these uh, appear in folks um, in reports, but uh, I'll kick off again um, on a slide presentation. So some of these are international fits and some one or two are local. And I think the real question is we have had incidents locally in South Africa with AC corrosion. And this has been recorded on some of the gas pipelines in the Mpumalanga area, so you can infer who the clients are. And also in recent times on water and product lines in KwaZulu Natal. And I think what has made this uh, challenging is that when the corrosion is found, or the, the morphology of it, if you could put it that way, is looked at, the, it's so easy to say, well, this is straight current corrosion. We've got the classic uh, divot, if you want to call it that. Uh, we've got metal loss that looks a certain way. But if you look at this particular diagram on the right, the smaller one with a pen next to it, that can happen where you have AC corrosion occurring under a 3LE a rigid urethane or a well-applied uh, epoxy coating where the, the coating hasn't quite ruptured yet, but moisture has migrated through, through yeah. osmosis, formed a blister, and then you're going to get this pockmarked corrosion. Whereas the one that's the diagram on the left and on the bottom, we see examples of typical divot-like or corrosion that sometimes, not always, can be confused with a DC interference. But it's often once you clean off the surface and you, before cleaning it off, you look at the color of the corrosion product or material that's there, often it's going to have a different coloration and a very possibly it's going to be different to the corrosion product coloring from a straight current DC induced type of corrosion. So there's Often instances where you collect the corrosion product and you send it off for analysis, and then you look at the corrosion products that come back from the lab results to also confirm the chemistry around the corrosion site, because you're going to have different reactions and you're going to have different products that are formed during that type of corrosion. Right. Um, Craig, just before we go on, we've just received a question, which I think is a good place to pop it in. Just a moment ago, we were talking about AC current densities. And the question is, is this the area of, of the pipeline itself or just the area of the bare steel, say, at the coating defect where we are measuring that current density? Very often when we refer to current density or the application of cathodic protection current density, it's often discussed per square meter of coated pipe or over a certain length of pipe, or you, you do a current requirement test. So, it, so it's often associated with a surface area of coated pipe, which is the application of cathodic protection. When we start to analyze AC current density, we're referring to exposed defect sites. So right. the slide that's still up, we have defect sites, which you could imagine the coating was still in place there would be small defects that expose the steel surface. So the current density would then essentially be restricted or calculated over the exposed steel surface. Right. Now that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. Having determined that there is this problem of AC corrosion occurring now on a pre-existing buried pipe, can we still implement mitigation Normally, it would have been done during construction, but now our pipe's been in the ground for, say, 5, 10, 15 years. Is it practicable, if I can put it that way, to install AC mitigation? Yes, it is. I think what's useful, just to give some context, uh, Vanessa, to that and why that is happening now as well, is that initial research suggested that cathodic protection alone could address the risk of AC corrosion. So... Yes, we've got all the pipes that have been buried for a long period of time. More pipes have come into the same servitude rights of way. And in addition to that, um, new power lines have been constructed, and often uh, new power lines would be constructed in the existing servitude or right of way. 
So I'll just give the headlines of the two um, laboratory tests in 64 by Brackner. It suggested that if you applied CP under certain conditions, you could reduce the corrosion. Use 69 corrosion rates are readily overcome. So these are quite bold statements, but just mm. bear in mind when this happened. This is 50 odd years ago. Then you get Collins saying that a conventional coatings and CP are effective. And then Hamlin 86, which is an American Gas Association study, saying that it's it's usually at higher current densities that we solve this problem. The reason I give context is because there's still a lot of discussion around CP being able to solve all the challenges. There are conditions under which it is helpful, but there are some where it isn't. So the initial thinking was that it could solve it. Then subsequent studies, and I'll just highlight these print 86, uh, corrosion failures discovered, um, and P's 92, same, uh, went back in, CP being applied, and they still discovered AC corrosion, Stadler in Switzerland, Rigor in France, and then subsequently Rob Wakelin, Gamma et al, 98, and uh, maybe some of the listeners on this presentation were part of that, but they were corrosion faults or defects discovered, um, even though the cathodic protection uh, was in place. So I think just to answer your initial question, if, even if we have existing pipelines and we've got cathodic protection installed, but now we update to the more recent standards, so we take ISO 18086 or we get the latest uh, ISO uh, cathodic protection coupon monitoring standard, I think it's 22426, one of those, uh, it sounds like an alphabet soup or a number <laughs> soup. But we've got all these standards and the crazy part is that some of them were only published in 2020 or 2019, the latest revision of 18086. And so what's happened is the, the monitoring standards have shifted and so now we discover that we have pipelines where we have leaks and yet the cathodic protection has been installed and, and if you've had good maintenance, They've been doing their job. So there are ways to do it. And I think one would need to get that AC current density below those numbers that we had on that previous slide to avoid the corrosion from happening. And just before I move on to the other slides that I have, this slide comes out of uh, the NACE CP4 manual and it gets updated from time to time. I might actually not even have the, the latest version there, but I think what it does is um, the right column just gives you an indication of the bare exposed steel. So like those little defects that we're talking mm -hmm. about. If you're applying a cathodic protection under different environments, this is given as a guideline. So, so please don't now go and take this, put it into every corrosion report and say, well, we're applying this CP current density so we've solved all our, our DC corrosion problems. But it, it's more of a guideline. And it just shows that if you have well aerated neutral soil and you had a bare sheet of steel, you would technically have to apply somewhere between 21.5 and say 32.3 milliamps per square meter. So you've, you've got a relatively small current, but it's being applied per square meter on bare steel. The context, if you have a coating, now we apply this amazing coating because you always hear the civil engineers will say that they have the coating to protect the pipe, which is true. So if you've got a good uh, coating on, then your current density drops to that very small value at the bottom of the table, which is 0.01. And if you've got very good coatings, it can be 0.001 uh, milliamps per square meter. But that's to the coated steel surface. And so what do I mean by that earlier statement? I think what I was saying is to mitigate the likelihood of AC corrosion. We need to measure what the, the AC current density is on the steel surface. So you can see from this slide on the bottom scale, it's a logarithmic scale, we can see the AC current density. And we've seen from that earlier slide that above 100, so in other words, if you look at 100 and you move to the right on this graph, above 100, you are assured that you're going to have AC corrosion. So how do we then manage it? We've put sufficient earthing or grounding, and we want to make sure that we maintain an AC current density below 30 amps per square meter to whatever coupon or measuring system we're using, ensure that we are on the safe side of these curves, that we, we do not have um, AC corrosion. So yes, it is possible to just address the issue. Long answer. 
I think I've covered a couple of things in that statement. Thank you, Craig. I, I think the point that's coming out is that it's important to make sure you're getting data that you can interpret correctly. And also just that cathodic protection isn't the panacea to all these evils. And that can be a bit of a shock to the system. And especially here, I think some of our CP systems are not being maintained as they should be. And then one wonders if we have an AC mitigation system in the fray as well, how will that be maintained? And if you say that our CP system is not adequate, what do we do for our AC mitigation? Do we still do what we do with the new pipeline, um, which is put in zinc, but we tend to put that at the bottom of the trench? And I'm not sure that the pipeline owner is going to be all that thrilled if we have moles scurrying down below the pipe. Yes. What's what's your feeling on that regard? Yes. So we, she, uh, Vanessa, I think the retrofitting, I did have a look for some slides that I could put up. In South Africa, over the last couple of years, we've had to go back in and do retrofitting on newly laid pipes, strangely enough, and on existing pipes. And often with newly laid pipes, if your, your software modeling has missed certain areas, or when the modeling was done in the years preceding construction, new power lines were constructed, you then find, oh gosh, we've got to go back because there are now unsafe touch potentials and people are being... They, they're getting that shock sensation when they're working at test stations, when they're working at motorized valves, because the potential is beginning to become technically unsafe, but also at monitoring facilities, you can see that the AC current density is becoming unsafe. So what happens there is you don't necessarily have to excavate immediately adjacent the pipe, which is obviously first prize. You can work safely at a distance away from the pipe, Provided the soil permits that I think it's not always the case because you could be in rocky areas and we know in parts of, of the country you'd have to blast or you'd have to use chemical rock breaking to try and put the anodes in. But the crazy part is you have to ask yourself then is, is the AC current density actually high enough in those very high resistance areas to still cause that um, corrosion? So you, you'd have to weigh that up. But um, often the AC corrosion would be associated with low resistivity areas and high voltage areas because it's a function of, of the soil resistivity and the driving voltage across the system. But you'd have to look at the design of the trenching and the installation of, of either zinc or the or copper weld alternatives or other cabling systems that are installed in a suitable platform. I can imagine that copper would be great. Sadly, the theft of copper in this country probably leaves that as an unviable solution. There are a couple of scenarios, not just locally, but uh, there's the trademark product copper weld, um, or they call it something else. The, I don't know what the exact name is, but they've created almost like uh, we did with Transit some years ago, where we did an aluminium copper blended mm. cable. Remember, then became these very large yes. cables to deal with the 30% the lower conductivity of aluminium in comparison with copper, depending on the, the, the weave. Um, so it does become less thievable, but if you're going to put zinc in or if you're going to put copper in, I think the reality in some areas, you've got to consider the fact that the grounding system can polarize depending on the chemistry of the soil and it can affect the grounding system uh, adversely. Gosh, that's that's very sobering um, to think of and quite helpful to know that there are solutions. Can we confirm, so we've got our pipeline, we found there's AC, the CP is not working uh, or stopping the problem. Uh, we've now put in some AC mitigation and how do we verify that it's working? I think the most important thing then, Vanessa, would be again to go back to measuring these um, values. There are specific uh, sets of data that you can um, look at in uh, reports, and uh, you would then put out data loggers, and hopefully you've got the monitoring equipment installed in the form of coupons. That's a discussion and a topic on its own, but it's essentially a small official defect that you create. You designed it in such a manner that it's installed in the same backfill or surround as, as the pipe, and that it measures the current pickup or discharge for DC, but it also looks at your AC current density at that um, particular location. 
And if you've installed your AC mitigation and we're talking in this um, particular bite size um, discussion about the corrosion aspect mm -hmm. and not the, the AC, yep. you know, the shock mm -hmm. uh, um, and safety element, you would then focus and drill down to these values that are on the screen at the moment. Have I safely um, reduced the AC current density at my coupons, and which was simulated defect, to below 30 amps per square meter? If I've been able to do that, then I can say, based on the current international standards, that I've safely mitigated or managed, I, I prefer to use that word, under the current operating conditions, I've safely managed my AC current density to below the internationally accepted norms at the stage. And I'm very careful with my wording here because if we claim to have solved the problem for all time, um, we also, I think, experience has shown, Vanessa, if you've been around for a while, the theft, vandalism, the construction, retrofitting, maintenance to a pipe, you end up unearthing uh, installations connections to pipe and they get damaged and essentially what you put in place to solve the corrosion problem actually returns the corrosion problem so it's not something for eternity there's a long-term monitoring a long-term um, observation that has to take place with the correct measuring tools thank you craig and i think that just highlights something that we've discussed in in previous discussions on the real importance of monitoring pipelines so that you have real useful data and you can make wise decisions uh, using that data and sadly the attitude of neglect and uh, the sad state of disrepair of many of the cathodic protection and monitoring systems on pipelines in many many places leaves us with a lot of questions and potentially a lot of disasters waiting to happen. So personally, my, my encouragement to, to an asset owner would be to, to try and get your systems back into functional order so that you can make sure that you can assess adequately. Craig, you made reference to the use of, of coupons to determine that, that AC current density. The retrofitting of coupons, I presume, is quite challenging because your pipeline backfill is no longer what it was at um, construction time. Can one do it safely and practically? Very good question. Um, I know that everyone's philosophy uh, may differ uh, from mine, but what we have done on some pipelines, and I'm busy reviewing the design on a gas well uh, CP system um, in the Middle East at the moment, and near the well head, the operating temperature of the system is rated at 100 degrees for the first kilometer and a half before the temperature starts to dissipate. And what that does is uh, two factors are introduced, and I'm going to just use it as by way of, of example. One, the operating temperature profile around the coating defect is not the same as ambient. So I need to adjust for operating temperatures and the CP required at higher operating temperatures. The same pipe happens to parallel and run under several very high voltage overhead power lines. And so they're going to have unique AC corrosion challenges there. If I adopted the approach of installing the coupons a meter away or 300 millimeters away or half a meter away from the park, the temperature profile through the soil, our initial studies are that you're going to have a temperature profile half a meter away. The park will probably be, you'll be measuring an ambient of about 30 to 35. 10 centimeters to 5 centimeters away from this, the, the pipe, you'll be measuring somewhere around 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. And within 5 centimeters or 4 centimeters of the pipe, the, the soil would have heated to be 80 to 90 percent of the operating temperature of the pipe. So, why do I give that example? What would be very useful then is to remove some of the backfill carefully up to the pipe by hand excavation, take that same material put a, a non-conductive spacer against the pipe wall and maybe separate it from the pipe by about five centimeters, 50 millimeters, install the coupon at that location, use that backfill material you've removed and repack that same backfill material around the coupon. Now, some people say, Chish, you're completely overthinking this issue. And I'm saying, well, yes, I am. Because if I left the monitoring under the same regime for standard operating temperatures, 
for that high temperature gas extraction well at exactly that point, I'm going to miss two things. One, the AC is going to behave very differently mm. at high temperature, and the DC discharge or pickup at that location will have a massive profile change at higher operating temperatures. So I'm suggesting that the monitoring be adjusted to the environment and the backfill material. It may take a number of hours more from an excavation and, and backfilling point of view. But I honestly believe that um, it's critical to monitor under realistic um, conditions. Otherwise, you will be installing monitoring, you'll be installing facilities, and you will not understand the risk that you are facing um, in real time on site. I hope that's uh, useful. That is. Thank you, Craig, and certainly some food for thought. Well, I think we've reached the end of our discussion today. And as we close, I just want to really thank everybody for joining us. I hope this has been useful. Thank you for taking time out of your, your afternoon break and for sharing your lunch with us. And we encourage you to come back and join us again next week. And we'll be looking at AC safe, um, corrosion more from a safety perspective, human safety perspective. And I think that also looks like it's going to be a really interesting discussion with Daniel Hovey. Thank you.